If you would, bow your head and let's pray together. O Father, our Father, God of heaven and earth, the sovereign Lord of all of the nations, we approach you in this place today and we stand in this holy place, the place of your presence. The scripture informs us, Father, that we are to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. But the scripture also declares to us this hopeful promise. Though weeping endures for a night, joy always comes in the morning. So we call on you today and in these days for the power of the Holy Spirit to weep and to mourn, but also to enter in to a deep place of joy and celebration, knowing that you are the Alpha, you are the Omega, you are the beginning, and you are the end. Touch every heart and life in this service and those who hear it today. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have felt the dark of night Questioning what is out of sight He is the answer, he is the light And if you have felt the weight of sin Bound by the shame that's hemmed you in He broke the chain will forgive lift your head morning is coming there's more to the story don't forget in grief and in glory still great is his faith Faithfulness, wait on him, rest in him, come find your peace. 
trust in him, hope in him, great is his faithfulness. I cherish this opportunity to stand here to honor my dear friend, Gutty, Buddy, Governor Buddy Romer, today. There's so much that could be said about this very special man and friend. Chaz, Carolina, and Dakota are just hoping I can get through it. And me too. I was 30 years old in 1986 when I first heard Congressman Buddy Romer speak at a small breakfast downtown. Wow. Wow. It was soon after I became a Romerista in the Roma Revolution. I got the T-shirt, literally. My wife packed it or I'd have it today. I couldn't find it. But I got so much more from Buddy. Buddy inspired me, and no doubt each of you. It's one of the reasons why we are here today honoring him. He set the standard for an honest political campaign, telling me big ideas be big money. We believed in his vision for Louisiana, and we were proud to fight at his side for a better future. In the 1987 campaign, I remember the day before the election, when it was obvious Buddy was surging from fifth into first place. We were in the headquarters, and one of the, uh, the staff walked into Buddy's office and said there were three businessmen in the lobby who wanted to see him, 
and each had a $5,000 maximum contribution. We all knew they'd already supported the other candidates, but they wanted to get on board just in time. Buddy simply instructed the staffer to please tell them, leave the office and take your money with you. Buddy wasn't a political candidate, he was a principled candidate. He changed our politics. He changed Louisiana. He changed each one of us. Buddy raised the bar on ethics and politics and campaign finance before it was the law. He led by example, proving Louisiana could do better. Buddy embodied the revolution. Buddy Romer was a public servant, not a politician. A politician tells you he'll scrub the budget on the campaign trail, but then further muddies it up once in office. Buddy was not that guy. He told the voters what he would do if he was elected, and then actually did his best to accomplish that goal as governor. That's called leadership. Buddy Romer was a leader. A friend shared a story with me this week. He emailed and said, quote, after being governor, Buddy was teaching at Harvard. I was lucky to have him as a seatmate in coach, flying from Atlanta to Baton Rouge. I remember the conversation being high level. I struggled to keep up. As we were descending into Baton Rouge, he became animated while looking out the window. I recall him saying, I always get excited knowing I'm, I'm about to be back in Louisiana. We all know Buddy loved Louisiana. Remember, he loved Louisiana enough to make some people angry. Buddy was one of the smartest people I've known, and there can be no doubt the best orator we ever heard. No one could capture the hearts, minds, and attention of a room better than Buddy. He had a gift, and he used it for good to help others. He also read more books in a year than most read in a lifetime a love passed on to him by his parents. Every Christmas, I looked forward to when Buddy would give me the latest new book he had discovered. If only I had a dollar for each time a friend would come up to me and say, hey, Rolf, I saw Buddy Romer at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> In each of our lives, there are a small number of people who have a profound effect on the direction we take. Our parents... Spouse, a mentor, and best friends. Buddy Romer was one of my best friends. I loved his passion for life and his courage to take a stand and speak truth to power. He was unconventional, unconventional, all often going against the grain as we all know, and I so admired him for that. I dislike much about politics, especially today, but I must acknowledge that it was politics that brought Buddy and me together. It's also re the reason that his family and many of you here today are an important part of my family's life. For that, Tita and I are forever grateful and cherish those relationships. We all won together, and yes, we lost together but we never quit. My friendship with Buddy has lasted for decades. We ate together at Zeeland's, Waffle House, and Fairway View. We went to LSU games together. We prayed together, and we were in business together, starting two banks that he led and was so proud of because it was another way he could help people. He was also proud of his large Romer family that he loved dearly, including his wife, Scarlett, Caroline, Chaz, and Tina, Dakota, and Heather, grandchildren, Adeline, Charles, Owen, Ripley, and Dax, his brother, sisters, their spouses, children, and grandchildren. Our hearts go out to each of them today. I love Buddy Romer for who he was, for what he stood for, for what he taught me, and for being my friend. Like each of you, God blessed us to know him, and we will miss him greatly. I'm grateful for the opportunity over the past couple of months to have had the chance to visit Buddy, tell him how much he meant to me, that I loved him, and bring him some of the fried chicken he loved, dark meat. 
It was tough to see this warrior in a wheelchair as his health failed him. This man was a giant, strong. A man who slayed dragons and only feared his God Almighty. The last time I was able to visit him, he was sleeping, so I sat by his bedside with Scarlett and Caroline, telling Romer stories. We laughed and shed some tears. I'm sure each of you today has a buddy story you cherish, and the family tells me they've heard many in the last week and appreciate each one. Our friend has left this earth, but his legacy and spirit lives on, certainly in his family, but also within everyone in this church, as well as those around the state and nation who were touched by either the Roma Revolution or his incredible life. I'm comforted today in my Christian faith knowing Buddy has, new, has been restored, has a new body, and is walking with his Savior Jesus in heaven. We all know Buddy is likely asking lots of questions and even sharing some of his ideas. I know I will see him again, and I pray his family will find peace and knowing they will too. There was a frequent phrase Buddy affectionately used often with others to honor them. But today we can all agree it best applies to him. Buddy, you the man. We love you. On Tuesday, April 28th, when Melanie and I drove from San Antonio to Baton Rouge to tell her brother, my brother-in-law, goodbye, I thought I would pull a trick or two out of his playbook and use a few metaphors and tell a narrative, tell a story of love and appreciation for being someone that we could follow, we did follow, and we will follow. I wrote about Jesus' wild and crazy guy, Peter. I'm not saying that Jesus had favorites on his staff, but I think he liked, genuinely liked Peter. And I think Jesus probably stifled a smile or a laugh every once in a while when Peter was, well, being Peter. So a carpenter and a fisherman had this relationship in which Jesus asked Peter to be a part of a very elite group, sometimes told Peter, you are right, sir, you've got it. But then sometimes said, Peter, you're wrong. You've missed the point. And Jesus rebuked Peter. And then forgave him. And in the end, entrusted with Peter the keys to the kingdom. Of all people, our Lord chose Peter to start his church. So many times Peter's words and actions got in the way of the gospel. But that's okay. Because he was in the game. And Jesus kept him in the game. And Peter is partially responsible for you and I sitting here today. Boy, was Buddy in the game. Sometimes stumbling, sometimes bumbling. Most of the time, though, right where he was supposed to be, doing what he was supposed to be doing on our behalf. Buddy, I think of you as Peter, tempestuous, spontaneous, and all in. Peter said, Lord, if you're going to wash my feet, why not wash all of me? I think of you on the Sea of Galilee, seeing the future and wading in. You were ahead of the boat, ahead of the others, yelling, come see. 
Come see. I think of you ahead of us all. We were just trying to keep time. Sure, you made mistakes along the way. Even Peter was rebuked by our Lord. But I think of you learning from your mistakes. Even a rock's rough edges are smoothened over time. So whatever you are thinking on this day, we will follow whatever you are running toward. May there always be a little bit of the Apostle Peter and a little bit of Buddy Romer in all of us. The world sure could use it. Amen. No jacket required. You know, people just thought he didn't wear a jacket. He lost them all. Uh, all over the state, he intended on wearing a jacket. That was uh, not the intent. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, it's a wonderful time to see each of you. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I wrote a few words down here, but I forgot that I'm 51 now and I can't see them. So uh, we'll do the best that I can. Uh, and I'm going to, I want to tell you a little bit about all of Buddy. And there are a few people that probably know all of Buddy, mainly in his family. Uh, but not everyone knew all of Buddy, his whole life and what he was about. And... I would start off with a, a Lyle Lovett line. Lyle Lovett was one of my dad's favorite singers and entertainers and, and friends. And, and his, the line, and I think he wrote this for my dad, but the line was, if I were the man you wanted, I wouldn't be the man that I am. Now, dad was that way his whole life. He always told me, son, if you're ever going to against somebody in a campaign or a game or whatever it might be, he goes, whatever you do, don't play by their rules. Play by your own. Now, dad was one of the most complex people. I think that's the nicest way to say it. He's one of the most complex people uh, I've ever met. And, and there's a part of him, a few stories I'm going to tell, and I, I probably will make a couple political things that some people will believe political. But, but Dad, when I thought about talking today, I said, well, what would Buddy say? What would he say to his friends and his family and people that supported him and and some, some that may have even opposed him, uh, what would he say? So one thing that was important to our family that we would want you to know was Dad was a whole lot more than governor and congressman. My dad loved to travel. And he loved to drive. I mean, we told him there was a, such a thing as a plane, but we had to drive everywhere we went. And after we had a few grandkids and a couple of us had been married and Dakota was courting somebody that he was about to get married to, my dad decided we got to take an RV trip, okay? And we're going to go out to New Mexico. We're going west. That was one of his favorite places in the world. So we pile in this RV. Scarlett managed to get out of the trip at the last second. Now, I, I, Scarlett was supposed to come with us, but... Scarlett knew what was coming, and, and she said, I think I'll just stay home. Y'all have a good time. So we went out on the road, had an awesome time. Uh, and, you know, Dad only signed, only two of us that were signed up to drive the RV. It was Dad and myself. Well, Dad made it about two hours, and I did the rest of the driving myself. So we're in a great place, Gallup, New Mexico, and we're staying at a... At a 
place called the Ranchero Motel. It's a famous old hotel out there where all the movie stars, he loved a good Western, and all the movie stars from back in the day stayed at this hotel, and their pictures were all over the wall. And at this point, we were three or four days into the trip. And I told everybody, I said, look, I'm going to get up early tomorrow morning, and I'm going to go empty the septic tank to the RV. And uh, sure enough, I get up. It was about 6 in the morning. We had a full day planned. So I get up, and I'm driving out of the parking lot in the RV. Well, there's Dad. Cup of coffee hunched over. Dad, hey, what it is. <laughs> and uh, he said, I think I'll come with you. I said, let's go. Let's go. So here's the situation. You've got two Harvard grads, an RV, and a septic tank. The septic tank won. Uh, we proceeded to try to un... We had taken a lesson on this. I mean, he and I... We, but we knew we, this couldn't be that complicated. A couple levers, no problem. So we get to the place, and we start to unload the septic tank, and I guess we did the lever the wrong way, and next thing you know, it's spewing all over us. Okay, I don't want to get into detail, but it was not a pretty sight. And Dad kind of gets out of the way, and I managed to wrestle it, and... I'm literally covered from head to toe, and I'm probably saying some words I shouldn't say. And uh, Dad and I get back in the car. We get back in the RV, and we get back in the car. And he looks at me, and he says, I thought we had a good plan. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that was, that was, that was Dad. He didn't cry that we made a mistake. He wasn't cursing. He just said, when we had a good plan. Uh, a couple other quick ones, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going to take too long, but I just I want you to know it's, it's funny when you grow up as a sibling or a son or a daughter or whatever, nephew, niece. You know, Dad cast a big shadow. Uh, man, he took a lot of oxygen out of the room at times, and... and he just had that thing about him. Uh, and so we, we liked moments that humbled him. It was good for us. And so we're in Hawaii. We go to Hawaii. Dad loved trips. We didn't drive to Hawaii. That would have been quite a feat. We flew to Hawaii. And I think this may have been pre-Dakota. We, we were really young. And it was me and Caroline, I think Patty, and we go to Hawaii and dad never really planned a trip it was kind of like he knew the direction we were going but we just kind of showed up at different places and he'd always tell you a lot about it well he woke up one morning and decided we needed to go deep sea fishing he wanted to go catch a blue marlin so we haven't chartered a boat or anything we just he told us to gather our stuff and we go down to the dock and the first person he saw he says i want to go blue marlin fishing and the guy said all right let's go so we get on the boat, and the guy's telling us, look, people spent their whole life trying to catch marlins. So I want you to know, and Dad said he only wanted to go for three hours. You know, the captain was insisting that we needed to do 12 hours, and Dad said, I, I can't do anything for 12 hours on a boat. We're going to go for three hours. So he preps us that we're not going to catch much. I mean, don't get too excited. We're probably not going to catch a marlin in three hours. And sure enough, Dad, somehow, we're not out there 30 minutes, and we hook a blue marlin. And they throw Dad into the seat, and he's wrestling this blue marlin. It took him about three hours to get it in, and we landed, and it was huge. It was 464-pound blue marlin. It ended up being a state record for that time of the year. Of course, Dad somehow manages the first time he goes out for 20 minutes, and he gets the state record blue marlin in Hawaii. And so they call the dock where we're coming because it's a big deal. So the newspapers show up to take pictures, and they, they're going to take the fish off, and they, they put a board up next to the picture. And it, it says who the captain was and then who was the person that caught the fish and the weight of the fish and everything. And I'll never laugh. Caroline and I laugh to this day. On the board, it says state record for a certain month of the year caught by Bucky Romer. So 
So whenever dad got the big head, we, we always would kind of mumble, okay, Bucky, we appreciate it. <laughs> now, I could tell more, but I said I'd be here all day. Um, I, I would tell you, I've had the privilege of working with my dad probably every day for 20 years. Uh, and it's, it's something else now. You haven't been on a roller coaster until you've been in business with him or in politics. Uh, and, and late in his life, I had to pick him up every day. He couldn't drive anymore. And that was something I would, I'll never get back. We, we listened to sports radio on the way into work, and he would curse LSU and everything else. And, but it was very interesting working with Dad. You know, deep in his heart, deep in his heart, he wanted to be a receptionist. Now, most of you don't know that. We, we had a receptionist. But the phone would ring, and before the first ring would, would, would even finish, Dad would grab the phone. Romer. And you could tell the other person on the line was totally shocked. Like, what do you mean, Romer? Who have I reached? You know, what's going on? And the other funny thing was, at the same time, I knew late in life, he was probably playing solitaire or something in his office, okay? He, we, we would meet first thing in the morning and kind of go over the day's business, but then he'd spend the rest of his day drinking coffee, playing solitaire. But he'd answer that phone. If it rang, he'd they'd say, Romer. And they would ask, to, they wanted to talk to him. And I'll never, I never, I can't tell you this a million times. He would go immediately into the speech. Friend, if you knew how busy I was right now, you wouldn't be calling. <laughs> the other, so that was always funny. The other thing is, I'd be trying to have a serious meeting in the other room, okay? And our, our, our offices are back to back, and I'm, I'm trying to, I got to earn a living. I'm young. I got family. I, I got to earn a living. I'm in there trying to have a me meeting and trying to, you know, people always expected Buddy to be the guy they were talking to. So it always took a few seconds for them to realize they're talking to me. And I had to try to overcome that. And it did not help when I'm in the middle of a meeting and my dad would scream out, coffee. <laughs> he wanted somebody to bring him coffee. And I, I'd have to get up from my meeting where I'm trying to act like I'm big shot CEO. I said, I got to go get my dad some coffee. <laughs> he was something else. Now, I will say this in all seriousness. The single most optimistic person I've ever met in my life. Not even close. Now, at times, that causes me trouble. We had people that would bring business deals to us, and they'd want us to do them. And they'd meet with my dad first. That's who they knew. They'd come to meet with my dad. And I could hear him in the other room. And my dad loved every idea that came in the door. If somebody came to the trouble of coming to see him, and they were enthusiastic about what they were trying to do, he was all in. He was all in. So I'd hear them in the other room, and my dad telling them how great an idea this was. But then he'd say, but you know what? Unfortunately, you got to go meet with my son. And so dad was the yes man. Every deal was a home run. We're all going to be great. And he'd send them to me, and they'd look at me, and I'd have to tell them, dad doesn't have any authority around here. <laughs> but the best story about dad, and this is, I think, exemplary of him. You know, he respected, he respected those who did public service. Republican and Democrat, those that agreed with him and didn't agree with him. He respected the effort that it took and the toll that it took on you personally and on your family. He respected business people. He always got mad when the government talked about taxing business more. And it wasn't as much about taxing as it was he didn't think the small business guy was appreciated. That at some point in their life, most small businesses and most small business people had all their life, all their fortune in the middle of the pot. And to hear people say they don't pay their fair share, dad would agree that America can do better. 
But he didn't agree with the sentiment that people take risk, don't deserve a pat on the back at the same time. We've had ups and downs with our business. It's never easy. We take risk. We love doing it. Uh, we love people that take risk. We love ideas that are new, unproven, deals that no other body, no other person would invest in. We loved them, and we still do. Uh, we had one in particular that we, that we had a very difficult time with, and we had, for us, invested a lot of money and time and heartache in it, and we had a group of people around the office in the conference room, and it involved a large piece of land, which we still own, in South Louisiana. And we were fighting every headwind you could fight. We had a trade war going on with China. We had the president at the time uh, changing what he said every day. Uh, we were running out of money. Uh, and we had everybody around the room, and everybody was coming up with their ideas. At this point, Dad wasn't his most articulate. He had suffered a stroke at the time, but he was smart. He was sharp. He mainly listened at these times. So everybody went around the room saying what they thought we should do. And most of them were like, you know, we've taken a good shot at it. We ought to stop. Or we ought to downsize it. We ought to make it smaller. This is our project where where we're going to show the world that you could use natural gas, the assets of the United States and the assets of Louisiana, and do so cleanly. This was this project that I'm talking about. And it was important to him. And so everyone else is saying the odds are stacked against us and we ought to take our losses. And they all get up and they walk out. And it's this dad and I in there. And he gets up, and he's had a hard time getting up. He was using a cane at this point. He gets up, looks at me, and shakes his head. He says, they don't get it. We need more land. In the face of every obstacle, when everybody would tell you to quit, the man said, it's time to double down. We need more land. He was an optimist, believed in this state, loved this state. I know we have several current officials and former officials in this room. He would encourage all of you to fight the good fight. We don't have to agree, but fight the good fight. Don't get trapped in what the political speak of the day is. Fight the good fight for Louisiana. Now, everyone knew Dad loved to read. I mean, we, you've heard every speaker so far talk about it. He'd read three or four books at a time, every genre. He loved them all, uh, fiction, nonfiction, you know, all kinds of biographies, autobiographies. He read everything, literally three or four books at a time. You'd see him around town carrying his books. Now, what you don't know about Dad was Dad became the book. I mean, when he read the book, he became the book. He was either the narrator or the author or a character. He was the book. And every book had something that he would learn. Every book, no matter what it was. And he felt compelled to tell you about it. Now, I can't tell you how many lunches. So he and I went to Zealand. I'm not saying he was a man of habit, but we went to Zealand five days a week for 15 years, okay? And he would start telling you about the book he's reading. And he would become the book. And he'd mean it. His love affair with books was about dreaming. It was about what we could be, what we should be. It wasn't reading just to read. It was to read about what we could be. Dad had a never-ending desire to improve Louisiana. He'd get mad many a day. 
frustrated. He wrote many books in his mind. Some of his best were, we can do better. We deserve better. We can dream bigger. Perhaps his bestseller was, don't let the past determine our future. A story of how Louisiana and its people will overcome. People will never know how much passion he had for this state. The man had diabetes his whole life and never complained. Would be giving himself shots on the campaign trail. Hands come home bleeding. And he would just talk about what an awesome day it was. And what an awesome state we live in. He refused to allow Louisiana's future to be defined by its past. Now, each of you in this room are part of his book. In some way, in some fashion, every single person in this room has written part of that book. And what he would tell you today is keep writing. Keep writing that book. Don't worry about your grammar. Don't worry about if you make a mistake. Keep writing the book to make our state better. Now, he would tell you LSU is the greatest university in the world, but it needs to do better. He would tell you a land where they make you choose between whether you're pro-police or pro-peace. Those are false choices. There's no reason we can't be a country of strength and a country of peace. There's no reason we can't be a country of great wealth, but at the same time take care of those who need a helping hand. My dad couldn't fit in a party. But he was most interested in solutions, not party politics. He had no time for them. I'll never forget, one of his, one of his good friends was Tip O'Neill. You know, in my dad's first vote in Congress, those of you who may not know, Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House and a line of a man. Uh, My dad's first vote in Congress was against Tip O'Neill to be Speaker. Here's a Democrat, and his first vote was against Tip O'Neill as Speaker. Of course, there's no wonder he got the smallest office in Congress, too, but they became fast friends. Dad liked debate, a good, honest debate. He wasn't interested in trying to fit somebody's mold. He was interested... And solutions. Now, I will tell you, the state has had many better politicians than Buddy Romer. No question. But I dare say they've ever had a better governor. Now, a few final comments, and I appreciate your patience. There are several people I'm going to name, and I'm going to leave some people out, and I apologize. All of you should be named. My dad, I don't think, was always the best at telling people how much they meant to him. But when you work next to him for 20 years, I know. I know the truth. He would tell Jude Melville... And his team at the bank, including his daughter-in-law, it's the greatest thing he's ever done. And he could not leave it in better hands. He would tell his siblings, Margaret, Danny, Melinda, and Melanie, 
you were the smartest, most talented group of people he ever knew. You know, and it's hard being the, the brother or the sister of the governor. But he loved you. And man, he was proud of you. He said Danny and Margaret were the only two people he knew smarter than he was. And Melinda and Melanie had more talent than him. His grandkids, nieces and nephews were the best. I'm not saying my dad was prone to hyperbole, but they were the best. And he would tell stories about them every day. He loved the fact that Drew continues to farm. You know, we grew up on a farm. Dad looked at me and Franklin, and he said he knew we couldn't be farmers, so he was hoping somebody would pick up the torch. And so he's very proud of Drew for continuing to farm. You don't get rich farming. Finally, I want to say two, two things, and then I may go another 20 minutes. I'm not certain. but First of all, we want to thank Scarlett. You know, being the wife of Buddy, not an easy task. And we want to thank Patty, and we'll thank my mom, Cookie, as well. But we want to thank Scarlett. The last few days of Dad's life, last few weeks, last few years haven't been particularly easy. In fact, Scarlett may say none of them have been easy, but those in particular... And Scarlett couldn't have cared for my dad more. In his final days, you should know my dad was at peace. My dad didn't have pain. My dad was surrounded by his friends and family. And we owe Scarlett that. We thank you, Scarlett. Finally, I would tell you There's a person that two people, I should say. My younger brother, Dakota. He talked about you every day. Not some days. Every day. And the thing he was most proud of was how great a dad you are. I don't know if he had a chance to tell you that or not. And then he had his foxhole companion. The person when the going got rough and people were going their separate ways, there was a person in the foxhole with him every time. And that's my sister Caroline. Never been a better person connected to my dad no willingness to give up none Caroline was always there for my dad and he loved you and he's so proud that you've continued and there's many in this room that have continued the fight of education in this state and he loved you for it now what's a man's legacy I'm Charles E. Romer IV. None of us go by Charles. My son is here. He's Charles E. Romer V. I tried hard to give him his own name. My, my wife said there's no way. And I'm going to use this as an example because I think it says a lot about Buddy. When my dad was in his final days and we knew it, we all went over there. And you never know how long you have. Is it five hours? Is it five days? How long is it going to be? Well, the first night, about midnight, I get up and my daughter and I and my son and my wife were there. And, and I said, uh, 
why don't we go home and get some rest and we'll come back tomorrow. And we stood up. We were getting ready to leave. He was in good hands. He had Scarlett was there. And Margaret was there. Uh, so I felt, I felt comfortable. And Caroline was there. I felt comfortable. Dad was in good hands. And I'd go get some rest. But I could just look at my son's eyes. And I could tell he didn't want to leave. And I said, son, do you want to stay? He said, I'm staying, Dad. I said, okay. We get home a few minutes later, my son stayed. We get home a few minutes later, I get a text from my son. Now, my son's Catholic. My family's Catholic. And he sent a note, and he said, can you... I want you to bring my rosary. And he, he named what rosary he wanted me to bring. He said, would you bring the rosary in the green bag? It's, it's in my armoire. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll bring it to you. I mean, what are you going to do? Tell your son who's, you know, it's, I know I'm tired and it's 1 o'clock in the morning, but your son's just asked you for the rosary, and what are you going to do, not bring it? So I brought it. So I was told this, and I'm... I, he brings out, he pulls out the rosary with my dad and my aunt and my, I guess my stepmom. I don't know what I call you. Call it my stepmom, I suppose, and my sister. And my son explains what this rosary was. The rosary had beads on it that were wood, olive tree wood. And it was from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus told the disciples, stay awake. Stay awake tonight. Tonight there's going to be trouble. So Charles pulled this out, and he told my aunt and Scarlett and Caroline, this is what these beads are. We're not going to fall asleep tonight. Now, Charles would go on to stay there for five days without leaving my dad's side. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't, it wasn't really about Jesus. And it wasn't really to stay awake and protect him. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that sometimes on the way to salvation, you will suffer. That's why Jesus wanted them to stay awake. He knew he would suffer, and he wanted others to know that to get to the gates of heaven and to receive salvation... You'll be challenged. You may suffer. But in the end, you will be saved. My dad's saved. I'm happy for my dad. Proud to be his son. And I appreciate each and every one of you being here today. I don't even know what time it is, so I'll say good afternoon. Um, I wasn't going to speak either. In fact, who wants to follow Rolf and Chaz after speaking? No one. I would remind you, Chaz, though, that Dad loved to quote Abraham Lincoln, who said he never heard a bad short speech. <laughs> Three quick things before I go into my story about Amazing Grace. The fishing story little bit, I think that's where dad came up with you to man, because throughout the time he was fishing, they would shout at him, you to man, Bucky, you to man, you are born natural, Bucky. And so I think you to man came from that, right? But I really, I think that's, that's where that came from. Um, 
reading, he did love to read. And in fact, he would say, I'm sure he read this from someone, um, but he would always say, a reader lives a thousand lives before they die. And dad has lived millions of lives from the, the reading that he's done, the travels that he's done. And yes, Scarlett was always somehow very uncanny that she got out of all the trips with Buddy. It's so true. She would show, the dog's sick. I, I can't go. Um, so she, yeah, yeah, very suspicious Scarlett. Um, but as you've heard today, my dad was uh, really, he was a, you know what I think might sum him up best is my dad made mistakes, but he picked out three incredible women to be his wives <laughs> at different times. <laughs> Not at the same, though. It was at different times. Um, and what's amazing about that is while two of them divorced him, and the third one may have, if they were together, a whole lot longer, they still stayed in his life. They ran his campaigns. Uh, they celebrated birthdays with him. Um, they loved him very much. He was too hard sometimes to be married to, but I think it speaks volumes about who he was and that he was a friend. And um, I'm always so proud that, that my mom, Cookie, that Patty and Scarlett could be in a room together. We, I think we have a picture someplace of Buddy with his three wives, and it's one of my favorite pics. So just a solid, solid good person. But as Chaz said, Scarlett has been incredible for my dad. Uh, he is not easy. My dad, I know you've all told me wonderful stories and I really appreciate it, but he was also really grouchy a lot and fussed about a lot of things. And sometimes it was Scarlett, oftentimes, too often probably, that Scarlett had to take the brunt of that grouchiness. And so we are forever thankful of the care that she gave him over the last 20 years, but in particular the last few years, and that she opened her home, their home, to so many of us as family members um, to share dad's last days. Just means so much to us, Scarlett. And I really love you, and I, I really thank you for taking such good care of him. He really loved you and, and cared about you. Um, after dad passed away, Scarlett and I have spent quite a bit of time at the kitchen table preparing for this. I would say neither Scarlett nor I are big on events and planning events, so we really count on our sister-in-laws, uh, my sister-in-laws, Tina and, and Heather, for helping us do that. But as we talked about what was going to take place today, um, Scarlett felt really strongly that Amazing Grace be part of today's celebration. And as you know and as you've heard, my dad, it's, it's a perfect song for him because my dad loved to tell stories. He was all about telling the story. And Amazing Grace is a story about the ability to transform, to, to, to move from one thing to something else, to move from something lesser to something better, the good to great, the sinner to someone that has been saved. And so telling the story um, of Amazing Grace was really important to Scarlett, and she asked me to do it. And so I said, well, you know, it's funny. Um, Dad tells so many stories, but that's not the story he would tell me. He didn't tell me the Amazing Grace story. He would always tell me the story about the father and the son who uh, went out fishing together. They didn't catch any fish rainy day, they came home, the dad wrote in his diary, you know, wasted day, it rained, we didn't catch any fish, and the little boy went to his diary, he wanted to be just like his dad, and he wrote, great day, spent it with dad. So he always told me the story about priorities, which probably says something about what he worried about for me, with my priorities. But Scarlett said that they were, uh, he was a guest, um, I'll say guest speaker, um, at my Uncle David's church in a meet. And Scarlett said he told the story of Amazing Grace and that she thought that it was one of the best speeches, if, if that's the right sermon, speeches, talks that she had ever, ever heard. And she said that it, it so represented um, for her where they as a couple 
were able to find joy and peace in that, that idea of amazing grace. If you don't know the story of amazing grace, and look, I've written, Scarlett, you'll love these. I continue to get these at the house. They have your name on it, and it's the wounded warrior stuff. So I still get those uh, I'm at the house. So I, too, wrote down a few notes. Um, Dad would tell the story, and it actually goes all the way. I, I found it in, I think Tanton helped me. Tanton, thank you for um, helping me. Tanton is my cousin. He mentioned to me and reminded me that in Dad's book, Scopina, that there is a chapter in it, and I think it's called um, The Birth of a Politician or something to that effect. It's towards the end of the book. And he talks about going to Boy State. It's 1957. He goes to Boy State. And he decides there that he's going to run for governor. And he spent the next two or three days campaigning. And in the, in the story, talks about how hard he worked. And he didn't go to sleep. And it was just, you know, grueling. He loved all of that. So early campaigning. And when it came time uh, to give the speeches, he, he had an opponent. His opponent went first. And, and Dad writes that he really felt good about this. Like, I'm a good speaker. I'm going to go last. I'm going to, you know, bring this home. This is going to go great. Well, he stepped up to the mic to speak, and nothing would come out. He couldn't, he couldn't talk. And he stood there for a long time. And in the story, he says he turns, and he takes a sip of water, and he clears his throat, and he tries to do a few things just to, like, calm himself and the nerves. But the words never came out. And he ultimately stepped off the stage, and he did not become governor of Boy State. And he talks about going home feeling humiliated and embarrassed. And he got home, and he says that he told uh, Adeline and Budgie, his parents, what had happened. And that um, Budgie told him, Papa told him, well, you know, those things happen, but you're the best speaker I've ever heard, and I know you can do it. So you just need to get back out there. We need to find you an opportunity to speak, and let's go. Let's try this again. You can do it. And so Dad contacted his church and asked if he could speak at, at Sunday school and tell the story of Amazing Grace and John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. And he, gave, he did a 20-minute presentation, he said, and it went really well. But for me, that was, it's nice that Dad's written this book. It's nice that I can see speeches, you know, technology. So I was able to pull some th things together um, around Amazing Grace and that story. I think Dad liked it. I laughed. John Newton, who, who wrote Amazing Grace in 1772 uh, with a poet named uh, William uh, Cowper, who was a famous romantic period, romantic era uh, poet. They were friends, and they wrote hundreds and hundreds of hymns. Um, but Newton had a style in which a lot of his hymns were very autobiographical uh, and, and about uh, his life. And he had been, and this is the part that I think Dad really loved, is John Newton had been a sailor. Uh, his father was a sea captain, and ultimately John Newton was um, put on a ship and had it pretty rough. I mean, he ultimately, in one point in his life, he himself was enslaved um, and handed off from ship to ship. And, um, but he ultimately was on a ship, uh, the Greyhound, uh, that was a slave trade ship. And he spent many, many years um, on those ships, going to Africa and taking people from their home and bringing them back uh, to Great Britain. And in one of those trips, they were off the coast of Ireland, and a storm, hurricane, came up. And they were in this hurricane, literally fighting for their lives for like 11 days. And at one point, John Newton, who got tired of pumping the water, strapped himself to the helm and the steering wheel and navigated the ship for like 12 hours trying to keep it afloat. And just when he thought that, that he couldn't go on and that all would be lost and that everyone would die, he prayed to God. And he asked God for mercy and said, you know, if you, if you just let us get through this, I will dedicate my life to you. Please let us get through this. Well, about that time, they come to the eye of the hurricane, and there's a great calm, and it moved 
John Newton. He believed that God had heard him and that there was an opportunity for salvation and for mercy. He goes on and actually didn't immediately stop being a slave trader. It was actually many years that he continued to do that work. And it's funny, I think about dad because John Newton was known for being this terrible cursor. Like he was awful. Like they talk about the, the captain would say, I've never heard those words before. Like this guy would make up cuss words. And I'm like, that, that's dad in a lot of ways. He would definitely make up curse words. But he was a, he was a, a rough guy. Um, and again, did not immediately uh, turn his back on, on the slave trade. But ultimately when he retired, he started studying Christianity and theology and he ultimately became a member of the clergy. And it was then that he made friends um, with someone that uh, was Wilberforce, I think was his name, William Wilberforce, who was a member of the British Parliament. And uh, that man went on to um, end slavery. He, he was an abolitionist and passed the, the laws that ended slavery, and he credited John Newton for helping him do all of that. So he ultimately, again, that transformation from a slave trader to an abolitionist. And it was, for Dad, the story of, again, everything is possible, and that optimism that even someone um, undeserving even someone that makes many mistakes, that they can find mercy and that they can live a life uh, that is one dedicated to love and to kindness and, uh, again, cherishing uh, time together and, again, what is possible. When I asked Scarlett why that moved her so much, what, you know, why, why that story for you, Scarlett? What, what did it mean? She talked about how, frankly, their marriage was nothing less than amazing grace, that there were many, many difficult times, sickness, health, lots of different issues, but that through grace of God, they were always able to find places where they could expand and move, get through the tight spaces, I think is what you told me, and find themselves in, in, in a bigger space to um, love each other and cherish each other and, again, share in their love for Christ and the church. Dad loved going to church, loved it. Scarlett told me that were years that Dad would go the early service at First Methodist here in Baton Rouge and then get in his car and go to the service at chapel on the campus. And if you know Dad, you know, he's always, he has the program, and you don't think he's listening. You think he's just doodling on paper. But then when you would pick up the, the program out of his Bible or whatever, you would see where he had made, made notes. And Scarlett shared with me the other night Dad's Bible that he carried for years. And when I opened it up, I was just blown away. So many highlights and, and in the margins, notes and thoughts and ideas and gratitudes that he would write out. And funny thing is, she pointed to one, and it is perfect for Amazing Grace. He wrote um, that, I get upset, sorry, one second. He wrote the definition of grace, and his definition was me getting something I don't deserve. He was a very humble man that loved Louisiana very, very much. And even though Louisiana didn't always love him back, he felt so passionately about this state and the people in it. And he believed in grace and kindness. He was never angry. He used to tell me, he used to call me the warden because he said I was just mean. I was always mean, and he told me I'm too angry and that life is too short. And I think if he were here today, one, he'd be disappointed not to give a speech. He would, he would like that. He would love to be telling y'all something. But I think what he would tell you is to never, never lose faith that all things are possible when you do your best. And when he was governor, I lived with him in the governor's mansion. Um, I would ask him sometimes, like, you know, Dad, how do you know what to do? 
Like, how do you know what's the right thing to do? And he said, I don't always know the right thing, but I try to do the thing that when I put my head on my pillow at the end of the night, that I know I did my best, that I was good to other people, and that I put Louisiana first. And I definitely think he himself showed amazing grace. And for that, I'll be forever thankful. I'm so glad to be a Romer. As Chaz said, we have an incredible family. And I, I think, thank everyone for being here today. Um, you know, you want more, you, you don't want it to be over, but his body gave out. And I know for a fact that he is in heaven right now. I've told a couple of you, he's either in a poker game He's either got one created or he's gone and found where the poker game is, or he is on the baseball field playing shortstop right now, and he's turning that triple play, maybe double play, but he's turning the play and really enjoying being with family and friends again. But thank you so much for being here, and we love you all, and I hope there'll be more time to get to talk to you and share stories with you. Thank you. Sing God's praise, then where? 
The Bible says, for it is by grace that you're saved, through faith, it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, so that no one can boast. To be with Buddy unguarded was not something I think was easy to do. As I listened to his children, I'm even more convinced I had the opportunity to be with Buddy on three occasions where his guard was down. Very rare. I was with him for a week, not on a campaign trail, not in a boardroom, not in a classroom, but on a three-story boat, open air, sleeping in hammocks and on the floor in the Amazon River Basin on the northeast tributary called the Rio Negro on a mission trip. There were no newspapers. There was no really place to bring a book. There, were, there was no cell phone service. The satellite phone was for the captain only. There were a few with some gray hair on the trip from America that knew of Buddy's political career, but most of the Americans did not. None of the Brazilians did not knew of them. And we were to take the gospel to one of the over 7,000 river villages in the Amazon River Basin. His guard was down. He didn't sleep in a hammock. He slept on the deck of the boat. And with his guard down and his eyes wide open, he was so available. Sure, he told his stories. And everyone enraptured, listened, couldn't believe the life of this person on the boat with us. Told about the advice that he would often give. Seldom, seldom right, never in doubt. And he prayed. And he participated in every way possible, which just so amazed me, as I did know about his political career and the humility of which you speak and the adventurous spirit of which you speak it was on full display there. We would exit the boat and go into the villages in the heat of the day, almost on the equator, and there he was in his long pants and often a long shirt, sweating with the rest of us. And on the way back to the boat, on this path, thousands of miles it felt from anybody. He declared, finger pointing, there's cotton. I looked down the path. I thought about what he had told me earlier. Seldom right, never in doubt. I said, nobody, uh, there's no cotton here. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't grow cotton here. He goes, no, no, that's cotton. 75 yards later, he stops triumphantly. And he points at a twig in the ground with three leaves on it, wilted and wanting water, and one bowl of cotton. He said, I told you. It was like a satellite from outer space that had zoomed in on the only bowl of cotton within 500 square miles in this area that's only accessible by boat during the dry season. And I think he knew down to the minute how old that cotton was. It doesn't look like what's on the lapels of those here today. It wasn't white and flat. It was worn out. It was sun beaten. It was, 
it was tough. And I thought to myself, you know, this man often sees things before other people do. This was his heritage. This was his conviction. This was his upbringing. A love for education. A love for service. The understanding of human dignity, particularly civil rights. The unique power of money, both to create and to corrupt. Fascinating. And we had doctors, of course, and dentists to help those in need and toys to play with all the children that we would meet on those five days. But I was so impressed with this learned man from Harvard. I didn't know. And I asked him, I said, who, 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 is, your favorite, who is your favorite professor? Because I, like him, maybe be overeducated, who read too much. I don't read like he did. He said, oh, Robert Frost. I'm like, what? I thought that guy was dead like 100 years ago. You actually knew him? Yeah, he was, he was a great teacher. I'm like, wow. Unguarded, generous, with his smile, with his energy, with his prayers. Amazing. Accessible. I think it was his faith. It didn't make him, from my perspective, complicated. But what often Christian faith does is make us conflicted. There's the good we want to do, and there's the good we must do. And it would play out. I heard as I read and watched, as you said, speeches, how he wouldn't just go against the grain just to go against the grain. There was something deep inside, and I believe it was his faith that allowed him to see things before others could. The second time I was with him, his guard was down. He called me out of the blue, and he said, hey, would you come by and, and pray with me? And I felt completely honored. I said, certainly. Where are you? He said, I'm at my office in downtown. So I did. I went down to his office, and it was just the two of us. And I said, how, how can I pray for you? And he said, I'm running for president. I said, Joel, you really? You don't meet people every day that say that and then actually do it. And I said, I'd be glad to. And so I turned my chair, and we were knee to knee, and we talked, and, and we prayed. And he, he talked then to me personally about what he had said publicly, that he desired to be a president that was free from the encumbrances of big money that would then demand that he reply in kind and do favors. He wanted to be free to govern and to lead. What a lofty ideal. Even though he knew it was not maybe even feasible, the, the courage. And I realized then, this is a gentleman that has more courage than the average bear, than the average person. And we prayed. You mentioned his Bible. I, Scarlett sent me those pictures, that horrible handwriting of his, all in the margins. And I think he had... You know, having brother-in-laws that are in the ministry, I think he had a very soft spot for a pastor. He did for me. And I would, Scarlett took some pictures of my name there in the margin. And I'm like, oh, what an honor. What an honor. The third time I was with him, and he was completely unguarded, really, because, because he couldn't guard himself anymore. And, and he didn't want to. His body has it, it given out. And Scarlett is as everyone has said, was giving him tender care. And she called me and she said, his days are short. Would you please come visit him? And not having seen him in a while or seen you guys at lunch, I, I, um, I made my way to the house the first opportunity I could. I would see him two weeks before he passed, twice in the same week. And the, and the difference in the two visits were just a couple days, but you could see that he was struggling. And so I, so I was entered in by Scarlett and and I was, I, was a, I was a little surprised at what I saw. There in this beautifully sunlit room was a bed. And in that bed was a small person, smaller than his usual small stature, bundled in blankets, head down, not knowing really what to say or do. I just yelled, Governor! And he lifted his head. And he turned and 
he offered that uniquely generous smile. Gavin McKee. I said, yes, sir. It's good to see you. And I sat as close as I could. And I grabbed his small, cold hand. And I rubbed his exposed shoulder. I said, how are you doing? And he began to cry. And I think it's like his son said. He called it an accumulation of gratitude. And I was trying to feed him words because he couldn't get them out. Actually, it was the only time in in our relationship that I had the verbal upper hand on him. And I said, "They they, they know you love them. And he was so grateful. He was so grateful for this life that had been given to him by nothing other than the grace of God. We don't get to pick our brains. We don't get to choose our intellect. It's what we do with those gifts. And so I reminded him of something that that devout Christians need to be reminded of all the time. And as I held his hand, I read from 2 Corinthians 5. And it says this, For we know when this earthly, earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on the heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we will not, I mean, excuse me, we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not just be spirits without bodies. For while we're in the earthly bodies, we groan and sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want new bodies so that These dying bodies will be swallowed up in life. And God himself has prepared us for this with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. I said, buddy, God is preparing you for this. And it says, and so we are confident. Even though we know that as long as we live in our bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing, not by seeing. We live by sight. I mean, by faith, not by sight. See, we, we're fully content, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we would be at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home in the body or are, are away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged, and we will each receive whatever we deserve, whether good or evil. But he knew that his salvation, his family, his beautiful family, his children, the blessings that he had were indeed the grace of God in his life. And he responded to it because he also knew that he would not, even with his own intellect and his strength and his connections and his power, climb a ladder to heaven. He would never work his way there. The Bible's extremely clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it says later in the same book of Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God knows we can't reach him, so he came to us and he gives us his son Jesus and like any gift you've ever received, you must take it, you must choose it. As Buddy did, choosing life, the gift It says later in Romans that if we openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. But he was clearly not perfect. He was often the first to point that out. But humble and hungry and desirous to walk with Jesus, to be obedient, to live a thank you life because of what Jesus had done for him. The decision to trust in Jesus is a decision that makes all the difference in this life and the one to come. Jesus said, you can enter God's kingdom only through a narrow gate. 
The highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult. And only a few find it. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus would say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This is the road that Buddy walked on. This was what created the complexity in his life, in my opinion. It's what brought conviction to be able to stand when the whole world is either laughing or criticizing you. To be able to carry on, to find the optimism in difficult situations. It comes from new life in Christ and the hope and the assurance that we don't have to guess or wish or wonder, but know that In Christ, when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That makes living different, and it makes dying different. I took full advantage of that one-on-one conversation, and by that I mean I was selfish. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the laughter. I enjoyed the tears. I enjoyed him communicating his accumulation of gratitude for his life, for his family, for each of you. I enjoyed it because his gratitude spilled over and it was really the gratitude he has for life. What about you? What about you? There have been many statements already. This is what my dad would say. This is what Buddy would say. (laughs) I would suggest, he would say, don't go through life and not choose Jesus. And so I'd like to read a poem by Robert Frost. The road not taken. And I'd like you to think about your choice and consider that Jesus is the road less traveled. He is the one I believe that made all the difference in Buddy's successes and failures. He is the one who made all the difference. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth and having perhaps a better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear though as for the passing there had warned them nearly about the same. And both that morning equally lay In leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I I took the one less traveled by, and it made all the difference. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for the life, the legacy, the changes that you have brought through your servant, Buddy Romer for his family, his friends, his state, his country. We thank you that in your grace you have given him what he never deserved, what none of us deserve, a salvation and an intimate relationship with you through faith. We thank you that he was real and transparent, his heart overflowing, spilling out, as it were, on us, the joy, the confidence, the courage, that we all got to enjoy. Lord, we worship you as the one who gives life, changes life, can take a darkened heart 
and make it clean, can take the guilt and bring freedom, can take the worn out soul and give it strength. We know that only Buddy's body is, only Buddy's body is here and his soul is with you. So we, we rejoice that we have a confident hope to be with you when we pass as we put our faith in you. So I pray that that would be the case for each of us here today. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I need to give just a few instructions. We have two dismissals. Family and Paul Barrows will be first. They will leave uh, accompanied by bagpipes as they escort Buddy's body out through the coffin. So if you guys can prepare yourselves, and then after the entire family is gone and through the doors, I'll give more instructions. So if our folks there would come forward.